Good evening, um, and welcome to the, our virtual lecture series. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Mabel Wilson. Uh, I have the pleasure to know Mabel for many years by now. Um, and she's a remarkable architect, educator, writer, ad advocate, advocate for all the right causes. So I, I, it's, it's, it's a true pleasure and honor uh, to have her um, today uh, here. Um, for for a whole series of reasons, um, many many have to do with the context of, of, of the territory and the conversations that we're going through these days. Uh, and I think um, Mabel is is one of the, those leading voices. And, and as our discipline and our field go through this process to rethink what have we done wrong, how, what should we be doing better, how we can eliminate. Um, bias and systematic racism in the discipline. But way beyond that, um, Mabel is an extraordinary architect, an extraordinary designer, and, and participate in many, many, many ways, and many angles of architecture. So when we think of architecture as a cultural practice, uh, Mabel is fit right exactly into that context of that definition. Uh, before I go into some of her more um, the degree and, C and CB, I want, I want to recommend everybody watching this, uh, three of the books that Mabel has been, uh, two of them, she's been the author, the other one, the editor. So I put it here so everybody has the chance to print the screen so you can go back to Amazon and buy them. Uh, these, are, these are three fantastic books uh, that can help uh, all, everybody and help all of us to understand many of the issues that we want to discuss. Um, I'm pretty sure that also uh, Mabel has a lot of many other things to share in, in terms of her practice, in terms of the work that she's done in all this front. But let me tell you um, a little bit more about, about Mabel. Um, she's currently the Nancy and George Rapp Professor of Architecture, Planning and Preservation at, uh, at the GSA APP at Columbia University, she, where she's also the director of the Institute for research in African in African American studies, um, she also co-directs the Global African Lab. She's been teaching there since 2007. Before that, she taught in many other places like Berkeley, CCA in San Francisco, which I think is where we met uh, Mabel. Like I think 2003, 2004, something like that. Um, and she has many visiting professorships and appointments. Um, her work has been. Um, um, with multiple interests, but mostly she investigates space, politics, and cultural memo memory in Black America, race of modern architecture, new technologies, and the social production of space and visual culture in contemporary art and media, art and field. Her practice, a studio, and has been in competition finalist for several important cultural institutions. And her more, one of her more recent design collaborations, she's a member of the architectural team designing the memorial to enslave African American. Laborers at the University of Virginia, which I think is open recently, if, if I'm correct, um, which is, is a fantastic project. I, I strongly recommend everybody to look at it. Her work has been featured in the Venice Biennale, the Art Institute of Chicago, Munich, Istanbul, and the Westner Center, Cooper Hewitt, to name some, some few. She also, as I said, is an advocate. Uh, she all, so she's also one of the funding member, members of <clears throat> Who Builds Your Architecture, an advocacy project to educate the architectural profession about the problem of globalization and labor. She has been honored by the United Artists for Fellow in Architecture and Design. Recently, in um, 2019, she, she received the prestigious Arts and Letters Award from the American Academy of Arts and Letters for her work on Global Africa, LA, uh, also known as GAL, um, which is an, an innovative research initiative that explores the spatial topology of the African continent and its diaspora. Um, so she has been also awarded many, many, in many forms and recognitions as a mentor honor for architectural record, architectural record women's and of architecture. She published uh, two books that I show, and she's the editor of, of, of a more recent one. We also, Charles Davis, one of the editors as well, lecture recently. So as I said, her, her curriculum, his big goes on and on and on. But mostly what I think is, is, is a super important, um, uh, the, the most important thing to me is, as I said, 
I, I would say that Mabel, more than anything else, is a cultural producer. Uh, she understands architecture as a cultural practice, which, of course, it has a professional development and disciplinary development and education component, but it's a way to see the world and society. So I, 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 there's not many people that I think are much more, um, they're a more important voice to hear during these times than Mabel Wilson. So as I said, it's, it's our honor and our pleasure to have you with us, Mabel. Uh, hopefully we can do it again soon in person. Uh, but once again, thank you for taking the time to doing this. Um, Please join me to welcome uh, Mabel Wilson to our virtual lecture series from the spring. So I want to start by just saying I am speaking from the traditional land and unceded territory of the Muncie Lenape, and I pay respect to their diaspora and honor the past, present, and future presence of the Lenape on their homeland. And I want to thank Hernan again for the invitation to share my work with the sci -Arc community and express my gratitude for both her persistence and assistance to Yasiel um, for making this talk possible um, and the folks out there who keep who are keeping me connected and actually heard. So I'm actually going to talk about um, my practice or as, as Hernan uh, defined it as a, a cultural practice. Um, I began Studio AND uh, in 2007, and this was after having a practice um, with a, actually a former classmate, uh, a friend, collaborator, Paul Karyuk, and we had a firm KWA for a number of years. Um, um, and so after you know about 12 years, I started Studio AND, and I chose the ampersand as a sign that my practice was both collaborative, as in and other people, as well as transdisciplinary, as in other disciplines. The diagram I'm showing indicates that my practice has navigated between written works, architectural projects, installations, performances, and curatorial projects. And as this early diagram of my practice illustrates, critical research finds expression, let's say, in one form, and that leads to a parallel project and another creative modality. But also, kind of what I want to talk about today uh, is to sort of explain why I've developed these methodologies in which to situate race and blackness um, in the built environment. So during the arch my architectural education at both the undergraduate and graduate levels, I recognized that in order to draw blackness into architectural discourse and to make visible anti-black racism in the built realm that I needed to transgress the, the boundaries of the discipline. So I consider myself very undisciplined in many ways. And so I turned elsewhere to art, uh, to critical race theory, to black studies, to poetry, to literature. Early on, it was the oath of Toni Morrison who provided critical methods in deep theoretical frameworks for developing my practice. In Morrison's works like Playing in the Dark, Whiteness, and the Literary Imagination, I began to understand how it was important to reckon with the ways that the Western episteme, ways of knowing, and its ontological framework, that is, ways of being, um, and the framework of whiteness, has made it provisional, if not impossible, for the African, along with the African blackened in the slavehold to become the Negro, to attain historical consciousness. This is the subject formation that the West imagines as being modern. Blackness is consigned to the past, to the primitive, to the savage, to the not modern, but wholly necessary, as Morrison writes, to give definition and depth to whiteness. That relegation to being on the threshold of being modern, awaiting development, is, as many have, have written, a misreading, perhaps, of what it means to be modern. Poet Nurbesi Philip, like Morrison, recognizes the trap of the West discourses. She distrusts the language of documents and policies, the language of being in history that cannot account for, in her work, the Zong incident, when enslaved people were thrown overboard a slave ship, Zong, 
And then the slavers went back to the Metropole, to London, and attempted to collect payment for the lost cargo because these were humans. These were not humans. They were, in fact, property listed on the ledger. Philip writes in her, her, her book of poetry, Zong, quote, language in which those events, the Zong, took place promulgated the non-being of African peoples, and I distrust its order, which hides disorder, its logic hiding the illogic, and its rationality, which is simultaneously irrational." End quote. What is modern architecture if not dedicated to order, logic, and rationality? But it can also be hiding the disorder, illogic, and irrationality that is the double bind of modernity, as we see in this early painting of the Republic um, that shows both liberty and slavery. The discourse of architecture, its representational tools, its historiography, its dependency on state power and racial capitalism, its aesthetics and technologies are knotted with this double bind of racial thinking, representation, and practices. So in response, over the past 30 years, I've engaged in a Black study, one that allows me to see my own history and bring Black cultural practices and sensibilities into the making of the built world. The studio is a place of study, and in that sense, my practice has been what Fred Moten and Stephanie, Stefano Hardy and the under comments have called fugitive planning and black study. Study doesn't engage what is known, but rather is a speculative practice, one that allies with liberation as a spatial practice, a belief my collaborator and colleague, Mario Gooden, forges in his work. Studio Anne has been dedicated to making spaces of collaboration, connection, and exchange through bonds of kinship, love, and mutual support. This is the ethos that frames my practice as I've explored themes of home places, rememory, and mobility. And I just want to add, I included these images of the Jennings and the Weems because they're focus of current writing projects. So they're things I'm thinking through at the moment. Home places. In my last studio at GSAP, um, Studio 6, taught by Stan Allen, we were tasked to unpack the single family American suburban house through techniques of collage. I chose to unpack latent blackness and the invisible forces of anti-black racism. Growing up in a little white house seen here in coastal New Jersey in the 1960s, my entree into the world of language and ideas was through a book, Before We Read, whose pictures shown here not only reinforce gendered roles, but whose whiteness was also normalized, not by words, but by image images. This common edition of the Dick and Jane Primer series reinforced that even before we read words, we decode the world through images, and clearly neither is neutral. For my Studio 6 project for Stan, I unpack Morrison's epigraph in her novel, The Bluest Eye where she carves away at this type of iconic Dick and Jane primer. Note here how the first paragraph introduces the single family house of the suburb. Here is the house, its generic colors, its entry, and the family that resides there. Notice how it teaches us reading through forms of identification, types of sociality, what is aesthetically pleasing, and various effective responses. It makes learning to read possible. Now in the second paragraph, the rules of grammar, its structures have been removed. We can only read words, but without the pauses of capitalization and punctuation. As a consequence, meaning in the second paragraph becomes elusive. In the third paragraph, Morrison carves away even more by removing the space between the words. The string of letters makes the detection of words difficult and thus makes reading difficult and even enunciation impossible. It evokes both madness and silence latent in the text. In The Bluest Eye, Morrison tells the story of a black girl, Pecola, 
who lives amidst untold violence and suffering. Pecola, however, believes that if she had blue eyes, hence if she were white, she would be beautiful, hence happy and safe. Insanity, as we move through the story, becomes her refuge. This, opera this operational method on the found object, the primer, provided a way to uncover the hidden powers and logics of representation and meaning, how whiteness and patriarchy orders meaning in space, even in language. I asked myself, can the same operation be applied to the rational methods of architectural representation through drawing? Levittown became my site of operation. A long history of white settler colonialism, which forged whiteness as property, as Cheryl Harris writes, through restrictive covenants and bank lending. These practices ensured that America's post-war federally financed suburbs stayed white and heteronormative. Why did you select Levittown to live? We were looking for a place to buy a home. We looked at Levittown and we liked the homes here. We liked the advantages that Levittown seemed to offer in uh, comparison to other cities. And we understood that it was going to be all white. We were very happy to buy a home here. So looking at the plans and sections of a typical Levittown house, I adapted the strategy of carving away to misread the spatial logic of the house through its own representations. The drawings dissected um, the space of the house to find hidden below the stairs, between the walls, inside the cabinets, around the plumbing, under the floors, in the basement, inside the attic of the Levittown house. Through this process that included reading the suburb in the city, where I also drew the suburban houses of the South Bronx's Charlotte Gardens, I discovered a house for a Grigri, a talisman for domestic rituals and a container for the everyday practices of black life. For this project, I looked at black artists, and particularly artists who have had a long history of working with found objects, Romeo Bearden's collages, for instance. I also turned toward the assemblage art of Betty Saar, whose liberation of Aunt Jemima became a generative figure collaged into the Levittown house and in making the house for a Grigri. I also drew on the familiar work of LA-based artist John Outerbridge, who passed away in November. Outerbridge, who is my mother's brother, grew up in the Jim Crow South. And here I'm showing the house of my grandparents in Greenville, North Carolina. My mother and uncle grew up on a house nearby, in a house nearby, but this is the home place that I remember. My mother migrated with my father in New Jersey in the 1950s, and shortly thereafter, my Uncle Johnny migrated to Chicago and then Los Angeles, as did many of their generation fleeing the oppressive racism of Southern segregation at the turn of the Civil Rights Movement. Along with their trek, they brought with them a rich culture of making things, of what we say, making a way out of nowhere. And as I have written about this practice, quote, home places can travel like people in packages. Any place you collect objects of remembrances, model ships and family photographs, or practice rituals of everyday life, cooked fried fish from old recipes or make lye soap, all of these things serve as spiritual entrees back to one's home place, end quote. So my Uncle Johnny settled in Los Angeles in the 1960s and joined a cadre of artists that included Betty Saar, David Hammonds, Noah Purifoy, and others who made revolutionary artistic statements from the detritus of the Watts Rebellion in 1965. My Uncle Johnny built full-scale installations that found beauty in blight. Again, the illogical, right, out of the logic. With architect and photographer, Peter Tolkien, hi Peter, I think you're out there. Um, we spent a day talking with my uncle Johnny about how he not only made art out of everyday objects, but also how he made architecture for everyday life. My uncle, he found art in many things, including the culinary 
and we shared the sweetness of grilled catfish while the soulful strains of Coltrane drifted through his studio in South Central LA. A is for artists. Door is open for the vintage VWs. The colors of blue, red, and yellow mark hazardous chemicals for art making, for the art making inside. Doors. A window is framed by the aesthetics of urban blight. The fragments of rag on one side of the wall, a towel bar on the other side carry rags for washing dishes, washing dishes. Screws as buttons on search of the missing mule made in 1993. Screws mark asymmetric rhythms connecting two countertops in the kitchen. Uncle John's space was deep like Sun Ra. And just like his work left an incredible legacy to not only LA, but to the world. Over the long arc of the Great Migration, thousands of Black Americans like my parents and my Uncle Johnny moved to and transformed the places to which they arrived. As Farrah Griffin writes in her poignant exploration of migration narratives, Who Set You Flowing, quote, after leaving the South, the next pivotal moment in the migration narrative is the initial confrontation with the urban landscape. The confrontation with the urban landscape, the usual experienced as a change in time, space, and technology, as well as different concepts of race relation, results in a profound change in the way that the mechanisms of power work in the city, cities like LA or New York. So in 1995, I began a partnership, KWA, and it actually was a kind of play on NWA, in fact, with Paul Karayuk, who now has a practice in, in Ottawa, where he teaches at, at uh, Carleton. Um, but one of our early projects was to explore our own familial histories of migration. For several years, we worked on the away station a full-scale installation that examined the architectural spaces of urban migration. We were interested in how migration as a force doesn't alter urban space in immediately apparent ways. Instead, these transformations occur over time and often begin within the confines of domestic spaces. We wanted to chart how communities appear and disappear and thus fail to be registered as urban traces. In these interim homes, in these way stations, people establish domiciles that are situated between the memories of the homelands from which they had recently fled or migrated, like North Carolina for my uncle and parents, and the imaginings and desires of places they aspire to be. For some, these homes, a hotel room, the residence of a friend or family member, a refugee center, is a point of transition before return to their homeland or a point of transition along a path of adaptation to a new place. The away station, borrowing this language of assemblage art, collapses these spaces into a dense amalgam of objects brought in transition. These could be furniture or clothing, sentimental objects like a candy dish, for example. And these merge with newly acquired objects of consumer culture. These objects are packed into dense space in which the rituals of everyday life unfold. And I should say, Peter Tolkien actually took our, the photographs of, of our show, um, first show, uh, at the storefront for Ar architecture in New York. The away station's 15 towers can be unpacked according to the space in which they inhabit it. And you see it here in that very narrow triangular space of storefront. And they can adapt like those in migration to the unpredictable circumstances of site. And the drawings appeared in the installation on what we called a drawing table. So you could sort of read the sectional cuts of the spaces as they were condensed together. As you walk through the installation, you also heard migration narratives. So in New York, 
Two Haitians, Jerry and Jean Uric, told their different stories of fleeing the wrath of Duvaliers. Ellen, an undocumented woman, shared her aspirations and recorded my father, who told why he left the segregated South, unable to find work and search of opportunities for his family up north. Here we see it in San Francisco. There, the migration narratives were of a Colombian woman, for example, who migrated from Peru, seeking independence for herself and her family. We also interviewed an elderly Chinese American man who had left his homeland at age four to arrive to a very different San Francisco in the year 1915. For LA, where it was shown at a space, I believe, called Form Zero Gallery. Um, we interviewed my Uncle Johnny, who told about his journey westward from North, and, uh, from North Carolina to, uh, to Los Angeles. As an architectural representation at full scale, the away station unpacked the architectural and psychological realm of home places. Rememory. Quote, I want to tell a story about two girls capable of retrieving what remains dormant, the purchase or claim of their lives on the present, without committing further violence in my own act of narration. It is a story predicated upon impossibility, listening for the unsaid, translating misconstrued words, and refashioning disfigured lives, an intent on achieving an impossible goal redressing the violence that produced numbers, ciphers, and fragments of discourse, which is as close as we come to a biography of the captive and the enslaved." End quote. And then this is Saidea Hartman from her important essay, Venus and Two Acts. So with that in mind, how do we build places for remembering the past from the archives and sites of slavery, which still bear the traces of physical, epistemic, and the ontological violence of enslavement. The African burial ground was is a rediscovered 17th and 18th century slave cemetery, which dates back to when the Dutch, when it, when um, uh, uh, dates back to the Dutch, and was located outside of what was then Manhattan's defensive walls. As a major port, New York City at the time, New Amsterdam was one of the largest slaveholding regions in the British colony, which then became New York. As an archaeological study has revealed, when the bodies were uncovered, as they were digging for a large um, building, rituals of buried on the burial ground reflected a diverse range of African cultures, Bodies were buried, often with heads facing east, cowrie shells, pins to usher the dead into the next life were also found. Of the five acre site of the original cemetery, only a fragment was extant in the mid 90s. The cemetery remained invisible, undisturbed, as itself was buried beneath 25 feet of earth until it was discovered when the federal government was digging foundation for an office building. A divisive battle erupted between coalitions of community groups and politicians in an effort to halt the GSA from removing all of the remains. The GSA's logic is if we dug up all the remains, the site was no longer historical. It was ahistorical. So Paul Carioca and I, as KWA, were finalists for a competition to build a memorial on the site of the African burial ground. Our project, Sacred Ground, made visible this buried history by becoming a gathering place, a garden for the descendants of New York's enslaved community. And I say descendants in quotes because there were no direct traces back between those who are now living in the city and those who were buried there but nonetheless, they were honoring their ancestors. So we worked together with landscape architect Walter Hood to imagine the site as a garden whose caretakers would tend the grounds of native and medicinal plants and thus tend to the memory of the African ancestors. Made of transparent colored bricks of cast glass, 
the spirit catcher formed a bridge between the city and the sacred ground of the garden and the burial ground. The spirit catcher also marks a threshold between descendants and ancestors. The original burial of the dead was often clandestine since the burial ground was outside the city wall and enslaved Africans were only given permission to bury the dead after dark. So we wanted to fashion a space that recalls the bonfires that were lit to provide illumination, thus forming an interior enclosure for communal bonding and a home for the living and the dead. But there are other histories that are invisible and that also lay buried. When it opened in 1826, the University of Virginia's tin pavilions housed faculty and family. Its lawn rooms bordered 125 white male students and the verdant swath of the terrace lawn was crowned by the rotunda, the centerpiece of the ensemble that housed the library. And his plans for the academical village, Thomas Jefferson, signer of the Declaration of Independence, the second governor of Virginia, third president of the United States, plantation owner and owner of 600 enslaved men, women, and children over the course of his life, brought together an exclusive community in an environment he designed to be conducive of, quote, to health, to study, to, to manners, morals, and order. End quote. What until recently remained silent in official historical narratives about the university's antebellum period from 1817 to 1865 was mention of the academical village's dependency on an equal number of roughly 150 at one time enslaved men, women, and children. And as we see here, an enslaved woman taking care of a white child of one of the professors in this very famous engraving of the University of Virginia in its early years. This history has hid in plain sight for 155 years. In 2007, UVA's boards of, Board of Visitors authorized the installation of a plaque in the floor of a walkway in front of the rotunda, co-equal with the recognition that they gave to white craftsmen and builders who worked on, the, on building the university. This plaque had the unintended consequence of sparking student outrage. They wanted more. This hidden history became even more tangible to the community when archeologists discovered 70 unmarked graves behind the universal's official, university's official cemetery. A ceremony of memorialization that began in the community and ended in the cemetery recognized those lives. And after this, the students demanded a much more visible recognition of the enslaved community at UVA. So in 2016, I joined with architects Mi Jin Yoon and Eric Howler, activist and conflict mediator Frank Dukes, and landscape architect Greg Bleen to compete for and win the commission to design the Memorial to Enslaved Laborers at UVA, which opened this past spring. Brooklyn-based artist Eto Otitigbe joined us a year later. So on the left, you see Mijen in their offices at Howler and Yoon in Boston, where we held our first charrette in December of 2017 to talk about, you know, to sort of brainstorm the project. And these were the, some of the images that, that um, kind of inspired our conversation, including you see uh, a work by Fred um, uh, Wilson, the artist, he's mining the museum, as well as the slave ship Brooks, and you know the horrific image of Gordon and his scarred back um, from being beaten while he was enslaved. And on the right, you see Eto and Frank when we were touring Montpelier and talking um, with descendants about the history of slavery at Montpelier, which is the um, plantation of James Madison. And Eto joined us a year later. So it was a lengthy period of engagement with the community. And so on the left, you see um, the compressed timeline of the first part of that engagement. And so over the course of about six months, we engaged multiple stakeholders on their turf, going to classrooms at UVA with students and alumni, 
to local community members at the Jefferson School's African American Heritage Center in Charlottesville, to local historic African American churches, and to the presidential homes of Jefferson at Monticello and Madison at Mount Pillier, to talk to members of the descendant community of those who had been enslaved at those two places. And in engaging multiple communities, what we heard was that the memorial needed to tell the unvarnished truth about the past to have any legitimacy, that it needed to bring the community together to both learn and reflect on that history of slavery, that the memorial needed to express dualities of not only pain and suffering, but also resilience, dignity, and the humanity of those who were enslaved. And lastly, it needed to be a living memorial, an ongoing memorial to acknowledge that this work of the commemorative landscape remains incomplete. We heard that, as someone told us, quote, as a Black American, I feel an internal pride of gazing upon every brick, every pillar, every garden at the university, and that knowing this fraught path has birthed an undeniably beautiful present. So we must feel beauty, pride, and gratitude, end quote. So it was important to think about the tactility, the materiality of the memorial and how it needed to be engaged to have it haptic present in order to have that effective connection. Along with collecting aspirations, hearing about desired meanings and experiences and its stories that needed to be told by the memorial, as part of our design process, we also researched black traditions and spaces of gathering. We looked for cultural forms and rituals that could be translated into our design. We explored how people gathered, for example, to perform ring shouts, a low country ecstatic dance that moves in a circle, whose rhythms and movements connect to Western African practices. So circular forms like the ring shouts or even a broken shackle became relevant in our design process. We heard in our outreach meetings that the memorial should forge a connection with the community and that impacted you know, the sensibilities by which we sought to, to, to cite the memorial. So in response and after careful study, we placed the memorial in an area known as the Triangle of Grass, just to the northeast of the historic rotunda and lawn area. And it's, um, uh, and it made it both visible and accessible to the wider Charlottesville community. The memorial joins a local commemorative landscape and the circular lawn in the center of the memorial was designed to be a gathering place for events such as the yearly Freedom and Liberation Day March on March 3rd, which is today, which is not happening sadly because of the pandemic. But it's, it's the day, today remembers the day the Union troops liberated the 14,000 enslaved persons in Albemarle County, which would have included the enslaved community at UVA. So here you can see the relationship of the memorial to the rotunda and to the lawn, and that the memorial is in dialogue with the rotunda, which sits at the highest point on the lawn, which Jefferson placed at a ridge, ridge line of a hill upon which the university grounds were built. The careful terracing of the lawn done by enslaved labor in section allowed Jefferson to create pavilions that were two stories on the lawn side, but three stories on the garden side where work yards, where there were work yards, where the enslaved would chop wood, wash laundry, haul water and slaughter animals. Jefferson understood slavery to be abhorrent and employed architecture in the architectural section to conceal that labor. The memorial, in contrast, works to reveal, open, and invite, utilizing the landscape in section to create an open bowl-like figure, in contrast to the closed sphere of the rotunda, and both are, are 80 feet in diameter. The memorial is or oriented northward toward the direction of freedom, which people headed to north, uh, to the Northern States and to Canada to find freedom. 
And so the path on the left lays out a step for each year of the enslaved, that enslaved peoples lived at UVA. The conical intersection creates a series of nested rings offering multiple layers that unfold the stories of the enslaved. The center holds a gathering space, a lawn, which is inscribed with an inner ring that holds a timeline of historical events. The next layer out of the ring creates a concave surface of remembrance where the names are located. And then on the outer surface creates a canvas for expression. To develop the layers of history in the memorial, we work closely with a group of committed historians whose insightful examination of UVA's enslaved community and the history of slavery at the university provided rich material. To name names, to tell the story of the enslaved, required that we engage with an archive of work ledgers, like Saidia mentioned, and personal letters of slave owners. As such, it is an archive of daily life, one laced with silences and violence. The university rented the majority of its workers to build the university and to take care of the grounds. However, the professors owned slaves who cleaned, cooked, and took care of families and maintained the classrooms where students learned. And the hotel owners, where students ate, also owned enslaved people who cooked, served, cared for, and cleaned the student rooms. Now, historians estimated that about 4,000 men, women, and children built, labored, and lived at UVA between 1817 and 1865. But we know very little about the details of their lives. We recognize the 4,000 by memory marks, which are arrayed across the inner arc of the memorial. For most, 3,111 persons to be exact, the archives do not record a first name or a last name. As the spreadsheet on the right shows, found records give us 889 persons. Of those 889 references, we know mostly the first names of about 577 community members. For a handful of people like Isabella Gibbons, Sally Cottrell, or Henry Martin, we know a first name and a last name. For the remaining 311 recorded persons, we used kinship relationships, such as occupations and occupations to remember their lives. So as you walk into the memorial, the walls rise up and they become you become enveloped by a genealogical cloud of names, relationships, and occupations. The list of names uh, and traditional features of Western memorials reimagines social relations and, uh, and rehumanizes the experiences of the enslaved. As a result, visitors engage Henry and Isabella Gibbons, Jane, Jack, Robert, and Randall as families of sisters and grandmothers uncles and friends as workers who took pride in what they did as woodcutters and janitors, laundresses and fiddlers. Carved into the granite, 4,000 memory marks speak back, sometimes with tears, to their descendants and to us. The tactility of the granite draws us to it, to touch and to be touched. The names for remembering the enslaved across from the bench with the, the, the names of, of um, for remembering the enslaved sit across from a bench with a timeline and a water feature that captures the attention of visitors who learn a very different history of the university. In contrast to the wall of marks and names, which rises and inclines outward, a shallow near level water table shares with visitors the history of enslavement at the university. Positioned just below the knee, visitors lean in, almost bowing, in order to read the entries on the timeline. The 70, 70 entries inscribed into the water table begin with the arrival of the enslaved to Virginia in 1619 and ends with the passing of Isabella Gibbons in 1890. It covers the arrival of 
10 enslaved laborers who cleared the land that would become UVA in 1817. And it covers a history of transactions, work, and violence. In re reference to libation rituals and the currents of rivers that carried people to freedom, a steady stream of shallow water washes over the entire arc of the timeline. Isabella Gibbons, that I've mentioned, was a teacher and founder of the Freedmen School, which became the Jefferson School in Charlottesville. While enslaved, she taught herself to read and write and passed, they believe, that ability on to her husband. She's the only member of the enslaved community at UVA for, from which the archives have yielded a full name, a date of death, a photograph, and a brief written record of her experiences. She serves as a witness to her community. This is what she remembers, and she wrote this in 1867 in a Freedman's public publication. She wrote, quote, can we forget the crack of the whip, cowhide, whipping post, the auction block, the handcuffs, the spaniels, the iron collar, the Negro trader tearing the young child from its mother's breast as a whelp from the lioness? Have we forgotten by these horrible cruelties, hundreds of our race have been killed? No, we have not, or ever will." End quote. So her remembrance of slavery, of the violence that makes the slave, is what appears at the end of the historical timeline. When Eto came aboard in the team, he became interested in layering the information we had gleaned from our conversations, from our visit to historic sites, and from the archives, such as the rare photographs of enslaved people at UVA. Rough tombstones from the Daughters of Zion African American burial ground yielded fascinating results as, as, as Eto became acquainted with the, with the landscape. And so he started to think about how vertical quarry marks in stone um, would be left as, as workers, as skilled masons worked away at the stone, you know, so that the stone bears the traces of that labor. So what we're looking at is a close-up of the photograph of Isabella Gibbons' eyes. The original image is in the archives of the Boston Public Library. She was enslaved by Professor William Barton Rogers, um, who would leave, who was a mathematics professor at UVA, and would leave and move to Boston and go on and found MIT. To realize this relief image in stone, the team had to develop a unique process and customize software. First, we needed to translate the, the intensity data from the photograph into a virtual model. Then we generated a machine tool path to create virtual, a virtual surface that was overlaid onto a digital model of the memorial's curved surface. All of this took di place digitally, working with remote teams before we cut into the stone. And we worked with a fabulous um, fabricator in Madison, Wisconsin, Cora, um, who worked with us at every step um, of fabrication. And then we worked with our, our, our um, contractor, Team Henry, a Black-owned firm in um, Richmond who took meticulous care in installing the many pieces um, of the memorial um, on site. So now we see um, a section of the memorial's exterior and, and Eto's tribute to um, Isabella Gibbons. And so we see this image. And because it's a lenticular image, she appears and disappears. She has a haunting presence in the memorials. And so the eyes of Isabella are symbolic of all of those who were enslaved and their descendants who witnessed this change and hopefully a more positive change for Black people. So, the engagement continues to make this a living memorial. As the construction began, UVA hired a genealogist, Dr. Shelley Murphy, seen here on the right, to trace the descendants of the enslaved whose names have been discovered by historians and ascribed them upon the walls of the memorials. And pictured here, we have two descendants, 
to, uh, De Tessa gathers in the center and Col Colleen Yates on the left. Colleen is also part of the descendant community of Monticello and both are local activists and leaders of these descendant communities. So the memorial's reflective and inscribed surfaces, its paths and gathering spaces commemorate a community of black men, women, and children who lived lives who worked and played, weeped, died, escaped, resisted, and, and refused enslavement together. We remember their suffering, their dignity, and their freedom, as did the protest days after the construction fence was removed in June. Um, a protest appeared, organized by UVA's medical school's White Coats for Black Lives who took the knee for eight minutes and 40 seconds in remembrance of the murder of George Floyd, a gruesome reminder that the violence and injustices persist in the wake of slavery. The Memorial for Enslaved Laborers came into fruition through a collective desire to face the past, to reckon with the truth, including the horrible cruelties, as the Gibbons quote on the timeline described. With Isabella Gibbons as the witness for and the watcher of her community, the memorial brings together their lives, known and unknown, to ours. Mobility. For Toni Morrison, it is not only technology that is the hallmark of modernity, but more so it is migration with the transatlantic slave trade commencing one of the longest and largest forced migrations in human history, whose trails today are followed by the circuits of global trade and neoliberalism. In a photo project with architect and photographer, Peter Tolkien, we wanted to examine African modernism, what curator and theorist Okwe and Weezer argues accomplishes modernity, but in a very different manner. Oakley wrote, quote, to begin with, this modernism is not founded on an ideology of the universal, nor is it based on the recognition and assimilation of an autonomous European modernism or on the continuity of the epistemic field of artistic territorialization conceived and consecrated by the colonial project, end quote. We decided to take up Oakley's charge and look more closely at African modernism and more specifically at the modern architecture of Ghana. But this raised many questions about how African this architecture really was, since most of it was designed by non ghanaians What were the other stories of modernity to be learned looking at these works and in their contest? Were there stories of other modernisms to be heard? As outsiders, we asked ourselves, rather than look, what if we also listened instead? So this grid depicts two single family residences for Ghanaian elites um, from the early 19th century, from the early 1960s rather. The upper left um, is, uh, the left, uh, the upper left, the, the left and the right side you see a residence uh, for a prominent businessman um, that was built in 1962 by British architects Nixon and Boris. Um, and the owner, Mr. Pepra, took us to meet one of the architects um, who still at the time we did the project in the arts, still practice in Accra. And in the bottom, you see two photographs from of the private residence of architect Kenneth Scott uh, who has passed away, and now the house is lived in by his wife, uh, who is a former Ghanaian diplomat and now a judge. And so all of this became um, part of an exhibition called Listening There, Scenes from Ghana, uh, that was exhibited at Studio X in New York and Studio X in Rio. Um, here were two other photographs. Um, this is the American uh, embassy um, that was decommissioned and modified, and it now houses the Ministry of Women and Children 
Children's Affairs, or at least that's what it housed at the time. We were um, in Accra, and the architect was Harry Weiss and Associates, and it was also built in 1956. Um, its unique structure of pilotis makes an entire base public and opens to visitors and is symbolic of a post-war approach to diplomacy, a new internationalism that was undertaken with a recalibration of old empires. However, as we all know, by the mid-1960s, American involvement in places like the Congo at the behest of corporate interests would be responsible for the downfall of many of these first democratically elected regimes. And the, the new um, uh, 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 embassy um, for Accra um, was like a fortress. So in 50 short years, the US's architectural approach um, as transformed, had transformed from communication and dialogue with others to one of disconnect and control. This group, which was the last in the show, is a cross-section through time and space of what we saw in our travels. The first image photographs the courtyard of Prempe College in Kumasi, which is north of Accra, designed by the London-based firm of Fry, Drew, and Associates. And this is from 1955, who did uh, a fair number of work in what was then called the Gold Coast, which included Nigeria. It was a school designed originally to educate boys um, and is still in use, and it's now um, both for girls and boys, um, which is reflective of its programmatic resilience. Uh, in the middle, you see the slave dungeon from Elmina Castle on one of the Gold Coast slave forts, uh, and it shows a Ghanaian tourist observing its interior. As my colleague Saidia Hartman eloquently articulates in her book, Lose Your Mother, where she counts her journey, she, she notes that nobody really has time for these old narratives and concludes that it's impossible to return home. Time has irrevocably transformed both worlds. And our last photograph shows the empty in branch office in the busy Osu district of Accra. At every corner and towns and cities we visited were peppered with cellular communication networks and brightly colored kiosks vending phone cards. This emerging architecture of the street signifies a new infrastructure whose architecture is that of a global aesthetic that implants itself anywhere in a city and the logics of high modernism and the international style are hence recalibrated. We listened and heard many stories and recognized different modernisms of Ghana, other modernisms of Africa. And here's one of the videos from the show. Quote, this exhibition, African Mobilities, also explores how freedom remains a scarce and unequally distributed commodity, and how freedom to move is increasingly becoming the principal stratifier in the long durée of modernity, coloniality, and neoliberal capitalism, end quote. In Pomatsipa, African Mobilities, this is not a refugee camp exhibition. So in 2012, I co-founded Global Africa Lab, GAL, as Hernan mentioned, with my GCEP colleague, um, Mario Gooden, to explore the spatial typologies of African continents and its diaspora. 
In 2017, we're invited by Impo Matsipa to contribute to her groundbreaking exhibition, African Mobilities, which now includes a second iteration podcast to which we also contributed. Global Africa Lab um, is a research project. It's a pedagogical project. Um, we have taught studios and workshops in um, uh, Johannesburg and Cape Town, Dakar, Cape Verde Islands, Detroit, New York, Salvador de Bahia, and Rio. For the pedagogic component, and you can see Mario here on the left, all of the contributors to Africa Mobilities were asked um, to, to do a workshop. And so for ours, we organized a workshop on the themes of our project, Immobility and the Afro-Imaginary. And so we gathered students from across programs um, at GSAP, um, which rarely happens in the school. And then we also in invited students from other schools around New York City, um, including City College. For the New York Exchange Workshop, we ended with a public discussion at Gavin Brown Enterprise at Harlem with the Black Chalk Collective. Um, we also invited um, uh, the phenomenal artist, American artist, and our colleague, Justin Moore. That day proved incredibly impactful for students because shortly thereafter, they organized GSAP's Black Student Alliance to acknowledge the necessity, necessity of collective action to fight anti-Black racism in the fields of the built environment. So as noted, Impo Matsipa's intent for African mobilities was to create a counter cartography of the hegemonic discourse of displacement and crisis typically associated with the mobility of black bodies, both on the continent and the diaspora. And so you see our work here uh, in the back and on the right image, it, this was a collaboration between Lake Jiyifus um, and Wale, the, the, the writer Wale Lewal, um, who, who, who did um, a project uh, in Lagos. And so we were invited to imagine um, speculative futures in places like Harare, Zimbabwe, crafted out of the precarity forged by colonial and neoliberal legacies across the globe. And so. Uh, Mario and I worked um, in New York City. And so I will share with you our two channel video.
Maybe, maybe we'll a single. Yeah, unit. I just yeah. <laughs> I have two two more projects to go. Um, so I want to show maybe another concept of mobility and talk about a project called "Marching on the Politics of Performance." That, like um, uh, uh, immobility and the Afro imaginary, sort of engages in questions um, of histories and their driving forces. Um, but this time, turning toward the legacy of marching in organized forms of performance. Uh, uh, storefront for Art and Architecture in 2017 commissioned architect and my colleague, Bryony e. Roberts, um, and I to create a research project performance and exhibition that explores the crucial role of the community's collective movements as acts of both cultural expression and um, political resistance. Our collaborators were the contemporary youth performance group, the Marching Cobras of New York City. The Cobras are Harlem-based after-school drumline and dance team that continues the traditions of earlier parades and draws heavily on the theatrical flair of Southern historical Black colleges and universities, HBCUs, um, and they combine that with the beats and choreography of hip hop. So early on, we met um, with the Cobras and we discussed the history of marching with them, many of whom were unfamiliar with the origins of their own art form. You know, in these sessions, they asked really difficult questions like, you know, what is lynching? And so how do you explain that to somebody who's, who's quite young? But it was a really, you know, kind of provocative conversation with them. Um, and with us, they shared their stories of why they joined the Cobras with many starting as early as age six or seven and remaining with the group into their early 20s. For many of them, the Cobras offered a creative medium that challenged the criminalization of black youth in public space. We shared with them the history of the 1917 silent march against racial violence seen here on the left, organized by W.E.B. Du Bois. Um, and we also talked with them um, about the revered Harlem Hellfighters. And this was a black unit that fought nobly along French troops in World War I when racist American troops refused their aids. Their talented musicians of the Hellfighters like James Rouse actually brought jazz to Europe. And when the Hellfighters returned to their home country, they were still seen as less than human, except in the streets of New York where millions literally turned out to watch them parade in 1919. So we showed the Cobras how and why black people took to the streets to be in public, an implicit protest against white supremacy and anti-black racism. We showed how the marching Cobras, their, their group, paid tribute to the drum lines from back in the day and the marching bands of the HBCUs, particularly in terms of capes and costumes. So we collaborated with Terrell Stowers, the Cobras founding director, and Kevin Young, the lead choreographer, who I showed you in a couple of slides earlier, to develop an opening sequence of very tight linear formations that echoed the historical strides and cadences. Rehearsing these traditional steps and drills was a very new experience for the group, one in which they delved into the history of these gatherings and their connection to political protest. The clothing of the drummers and dancers, and here you see um, uh, Bryony fitting Nija um, for his cape, um, echoed both the Harlem Hellfighters and the Silent Parade. The drummers representing the Hellfighters wore olive shirts and pants, um, and the dancers, in contrast, wore all white, alluding to the women who walked in the Silent Parade. We presented Marching On in Marcus Garvey Park in November of 2017 in partnership with the Marcus Garvey Park Alliance. And Marcus Garvey Park is in the middle of Harlem. Since it's in the middle of Fifth Avenue, it literally Fifth Avenue has to cut around it. Um, and it uh, was also part of Performa 17, the biannual uh, um, performance um, uh, event. Um, and we, we chose Marcus Garvey Park because it, it was an important site still of, of protest. It was the site of a longstanding institution, its Saturday drum circle, which anyone can join, 
or observe. So it's an important gathering event weekly. Um, but now that Harlem is undergoing rapid gentrification, high-end real estate and new condom buildings are sprouting around the park. These have brought noise complaints from new residents, particularly about the drum circle. So Marching On called attention to this community history and the importance of performance as a means of claiming public space in this transitioning and contentious site. So I want to share with you a bit more about it. And so, you know, the day of the performance in November, we made a lot of noise, folks came out, some more than once. So I'm gonna just share a short clip from the performance. So you see a sense of the choreography where they flip into the other side of the, the cape, um, and those are the colors of the, the cobras. Um, and so we wanted to also honor like their sensibility of who they are and how they perform um, in, uh, as, as a group. Um, so four months after these live performances, we opened an exhibition seen here at Storefront and presented marching on's historical material that had provided the basis for the performance and displayed the capes accompanied by two videos. You saw one here of the performance. And we hung artist uh, Jenica Henselman's prints of the costumed cobras in the park um, to draw out the unique individual characters that comprise the act and to celebrate black youth talent and aspirations. For the exhibition's opening, the Cobras performed to a rousing crowd of over a hundred spectators on the Lower East Side's narrow Kinmare Street, where storefront sits. The Cobras performed, however, without a legal per permit, since there was, once again, neighborhood resistance to these sounds. But we marched on, black and proud. So this past Saturday, the exhibition Reconstruction, Architecture and Blackness opened at the Museum of Modern Architect in New Architecture in New York. And it was co-curated by myself, um, Sean Anderson, along with our curatorial assistants, Ariel Dion Krosnick and Anna Burkhardt. And it's important in, the, in reconstructions that we recognize how the legacy of slavery still shapes the built environments as seen in these HOLC redlining maps of Queens in the 1930s, right? The impoverishment produced by that imprint of economic and political collusion can be seen in the overlay of the COVID map on the redlining map produced by, drawings produced by Studio And for our field guide. And yet in the midst of the 
gradation of white supremacy, black peoples found spaces of beauty, dignity, and joy. For reconstructions, we asked 11 architects, designers, and artists to create diverse projects exploring blackness and the legacy of anti-blackness, anti-black racism in cities and towns across the US. And this map shows where some of the projects are. It's Mario Gooden's in Nashville, Lake Giffus is in Brooklyn, Felicia Davis is in Pittsburgh. Two projects for Los Angeles, Yolanda Daniels and the artist David Hart. The green in the map shows all of the black towns settled after um, the Civil War. So we asked our participants to consider scales of the body, the porch, the street, and spaces of beauty, knowledge, liberation, or violence, and to pick one of 10 sites um, in cities, uh, such as um, uh, Atlanta or Miami. Um, St. Louis, in the work of Maya, uh, Amanda um, Williams, shifted to Kinloch, Missouri. And here is what emerged. So this is a preview. Uh, of what's up, and hopefully some of you folks can get to see this. It's been really hard for brown and black people to imagine a future in this country. It's been a real challenge because black people in America are not given the space to even just be. In order then to think about possible futures, sometimes we have to reimagine ourselves in new places and then find ways to get there. We're not just interrogating America's history with blackness. We're interrogating architecture's history with blackness. So here we see Mario Gooden's spaces of refusal, his protest machine for Nashville. In the back are the exquisite drawings of J. Yolanda Daniels and her Black City LA study. Lake Jayifus, um, we see here his frozen neighborhoods, a dystopic Afrocentric um, exploration of Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Um, and we see here on the um, right, um, uh, Felicia Davis's responsive textiles that is fabricating networks in the Hill Districts of Pittsburgh. And in the back is Amanda Davis's We're Not Down Here, We're Over Here, uh, that looks at Kinloch, Missouri. Sekou Cooks, We're Out Here, We're Out Chair, Rebuilding Syracuse. Um, and he literally uh, brought a porch, a stoop into the gallery and Jermaine, Jermaine Barnes' uh, spectrum of blackness in Miami, whose um, diverse cultures are represented by a deconstructed spice rack uh, in the exhibition. Black, the Black Reconstructions Collective that formed out of the exhibition of 10 of the participants, um, uh, the BRC created a powerful 10 by 10 foot, what they called manifesting statement that commits to quote, continuing this work of reconstruction in black America, end quote. Um, and it hangs outside the gallery to create a new threshold of blackness to the exhibition. And so here you see opening day on Saturday, uh, everyone was out fierce and blackness was there in all of its beauty. Thank you. Thank you, Mabel. Uh, thank you for a beautiful lecture. Um, this uh, at this point, we'll, we'll, we thank you. We thank the audience, whoever uh, and wherever and whenever everybody's watching this this new, this new era. People look watching this at different times. For some people, it's already tomorrow. Um, so good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're watching. Mabel, once again, thank you so much. And we're going to switch now to a, a brief uh, private Q&A for those, for those of you who signed uh, to join Mabel. So Mabel, once again, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for the extraordinary lecture. Um, good night, everybody from Los Angeles. Thank you. Good night.